So Jim Rogers probably needs no introduction to a lot of the people who are watching this, but on the assumption that not everyone will have, will have heard of you or know who you are, you're a legendary investor, author, pundit, a um, man of many, many parts, and a man who's always taken a, an unusual path through the world of finance. You've had a career which uh, is probably unique. Uh, some of it is well, well known, others less so. If, could you give us just a very brief uh, overview of how you came to be where you are now and, and this rather interesting path that you took to get there? Well, I stumbled onto Wall Street by accident because I wanted a job. I liked the guy who I interviewed, fell in love with Wall Street because he was a place that went, where I could do what I loved, which was following the world and knowing about the world. I was going to go to law school and medical school and business school when I was a senior at university. I didn't go to any of those things after I, after I could go to Wall Street. I had a reasonably successful career, uh, retired when I was 37, and I haven't had a job since. I think uh, it would be safe to say that reasonably successful is being overly modest. I mean, you were one of the founders of the Quantum Fund, one of the most successful hedge funds of all time. Well, that was a long time ago. You might as well ask me about my first wife or ask me where I went to university or something. It was a long time ago. I haven't had a job since. I probably couldn't get a job. If I couldn't, could get a job, I doubt if I could keep a job since I wouldn't show up for work very often since I like doing other things. I have traveled around the world a couple of times, once on a motorcycle, once in a car. You know, my second and third Guinness Book of Records were going around the world. So I've been doing other things since. I moved to Asia in 2007 because I wanted my children to grow up knowing Asia and speaking Mandarin since in their lifetime Asia is going to be the most important part of the world. And here I am in Singapore without a job. One of the things I wanted to ask you, um, and this directly touches on what you were just talking about, is in your very wide uh, experience, what, is it, what does it take to be an above average investor? Because by definition, most people are either average investors or, and half people will be below average investors. Um, what does it take to, to and, and how difficult is it to be an above average investor? Well, there are different answers to that question. I used to work for somebody named Roy Neuberger, uh, New, who founded Neuberger Berman back in the 30s. And Roy Neuberger was an astonishing trader. He would be sitting there reading the Wall Street Journal and he would say to me, there's 100,000 shares of IBM on the floor, uh, or bid 90 and an eighth. I would say, what the hell is he talking about? So go to the floor. And sure enough, there's 100,000 shares of IBM for sale. I don't know how he did it. He just, he had a sense of watching that they had the tape in those days. You know, he just had this unbelievable sense of timing and trading. He was a remarkable trader. Now, I'm horrible. I am, he might have been the best trader I ever saw. Uh, Mike Steinhardt's another great trader, some great, great old traders in, in, the, in the business. If you're, going to, if you're going to be a contrarian investor, which you know, you've been very successful at, uh, and you've had some, some epically great calls. Um, you know, I was in Asia when you started talking about mainland China, when you know, even living in Hong Kong, no one thought there was a future for it. So it's, uh, you've got a record to prove it could be done. But for an, I think for an awful lot of investors, both professional and, and, and people who are you know, doing it with their own money, it's incredibly hard to, to, end, to end up with a level of conviction that allows you to be a contrarian investor. I mean, how do you develop that level of conviction? Well, first of all, yes, you use the term contrarian, and, and by definition, I guess that's right. I never thought of myself that way. A contrarian would just say, they're all buying X, I'm going to sell X. That's not, that's not what I do. You're an independent investor. Right, that's a better way. That's good. I like that. That's why I said I'm trying to teach my girls to think independently, to, uh, to be curious. First of all, to be curious, to go and look at that thing that nobody's looking at, and then to think independently and say, they all say this is terrible, but I know it goes into my brain, and I spin it around, and it comes out that I know this is going to be good in the end. When I first was in the business, I used to assume that everybody knew a lot more than I did. They were educated, they had have experience and everything, and so I just assumed if they said X, X was probably the case. It took me a little while, but not too long to figure out they didn't know any more than I did. You know, In fact, they might know less than I did, even though they were experienced and knowledgeable and well-educated. So I guess that came uh, 
from experience. I was insecure like everybody else, but it came from, from experience that, hey, when I see something like this, it's often right. You know, maybe I, maybe I should do more and more of this. And, and I learned that from experience. Don't think I didn't make plenty of mistakes along the way. Uh, I mean, I was just thinking one of my great mistakes along the way, uh, but that, that, that built up my confidence. Well, what would, for the well, that was okay. Uh, okay. Back in it was a time when the market, everybody was bullish. I became bearish. I put all my money into puts, and lo and behold, six months later, I had tripled my money. And everybody else, I mean, it was really a massive bear market, and everybody else was losing their shirt. I became, and, and on the day of the bottom, I sold my puts. I mean, I'm bad timing. This was pure co uh, luck. Um, and I said, okay, I'll wait for the market to rally, and then I'm going to sell short. I don't want to pay the premium this time at buying the puts. So I uh, waited for the market to rally, and it did rally. And I said, for two, two months later, I waited, and I sold everything I had in six stocks. So short, six stocks. Well, two months later, I was wiped out. <laughs> I'd lost everything. But the main moral of that story is within two years, all six of those companies had gone bankrupt. Right. Literally bankrupt. I mean, I knew what I was doing. So it's a sizing issue or is it a timing issue? Well, in that case, it was a timing issue. I told you I'm the worst trader in the whole world. <laughs> I can yeah. prove it many, many, many times. You know, literally, within two years, they were all bankrupt, but I went broke first because but how of my do you, time. How, Jim, how do you know that the difference between being early and being wrong? Because, you know... Uh, you teach me that, okay? I'd like to know. I'm still trying well, to learn. I really don't know either. I mean... You know, one of the, I mean, one of the things that, that has uh, you know, confounded, I think, a lot of us in this, in this recent unprecedented rally. I mean, it's not unprecedented in history, but the sort of things that have gone up and, and the level of volatility we've had has been unprecedented. I mean, the only period that I can compare it to would be the late 90s, um, where just everything in, uh, in a certain area went up. Now it looks like, you know, it's almost, it's, in, at least in the States, it's almost everything across the board. And there have been plenty of people who've wanted to short the fangs, um, to short some of the tech stocks, to short some of these very expensive blue chips. And, you know, they've been, they've been very badly punished. And, and, and in the case of, even in the case of uh, very good mutual fund investors, people with tremendous track records like Grant and Mayo, who have moved to a higher cash position, They've seen massive redemptions because people, you know, their own investors don't seem inclined to stick around and see how it plays out. So, you know, both on a personal and a professional level, being early seems to be, you know, incredibly painful and destructive to your business. So, sure you know, can. if you've got a conviction, um, you know, what do you do? Do you do you do you wait for a, um, a, a change in momentum? Do you, do you use moving averages, which is something that I, I know people have used, and I've used something myself, which is to wait until the five and the 20 day, uh, you know, diverge, and that gives you your signal that momentum's coming out of a trade. Um, or, or, or do you just need to size it to a degree which you can, you can be persistent? Well, I usually, since I know I'm always early, I make a decision and then wait. And then just make myself wait a month, six months, whatever it happens to be, and I'm still too early. I'm still too early nearly always because I make the decision too soon. I realize so maybe I better start making the decision later uh, in life. Uh, sometimes you just have to throw in the towel, I mean, especially on the short side. Right. You have no choice. If they're just racing against you all the time, you can sit there and meet the margin calls all day long. But one of the old adages is never meet a margin call which you may have heard from, from old time traders. You know, if you get a margin call, just don't meet it because that means something is very seriously wrong. Right, that's your stop loss. That's, that's a, yeah, well, <laughs> stop losses are usually before a margin call comes. Uh, but I want to go back to something you said. The, you, you're, you're not uh, as experienced as I am, obviously, because you're not as old as I am, is, is what I'm saying. Um, but I remember in the early 70s, there was something called the Nifty 50, uh, and they were 50 stocks that everybody, the JP Morgan bought every day. Didn't matter. Avon, Xerox, IBM, there were stocks that always were eternal growth stocks. And they just kept, we were short them, and they just kept going up. They never stopped. Polaroid, that was another one. And they just never stopped going up. Everything else stopped, stopped going up, but those 
Nifty 50, which would be something like the Fangs today or maybe in the late 90s, some of the uh, other kinds of stocks. So this has happened before in market history. Uh, they eventually crack, there's no question. And to today, if you look at the S&P 500, for instance, in the US, uh, I think there are only 40 or 45 stocks that are above their 50-day moving average, to use uh, technicians' kind of talk. Everything else is in a downtrend. So and yet a lack the of market breadth. is making all-time highs. And so there's a lack of breadth in the market? Definitely a lack of breadth. You know, <laughs> what is that? Uh, 90, over 90% of the stocks are in downtrends. 10% are in uptrends, but they're big companies. And since the, the S&P is capitalization weighted, those 50%, those 50 stocks, 40 stocks, whatever it is, drag the average to all-time highs. Now, that doesn't mean it's not painful if you short those stocks, uh, even if you, well, if you short them yesterday, it's okay because they collapsed yesterday. But basically, the, the, this has happened many times in market history. It gets narrower and narrower and narrower, the, the, the advance does, so it's just down to a few, a few names, and eventually they crack too. That doesn't mean you're going to make it. <laughs> you know, I told you, I shorted six stocks once. They all went bankrupt two years later, but I lost everything first. There's a lack of diversification in having all of your money in six shorts, though. Yeah, but I knew I was right. Okay. <laughs> there were a lot. Well, you had, we just started by talking about how did I get the confidence. I knew I was right, but it was very early in my career. Well, that's how I learned. That's how I built my confidence, because even though I lost everything, I was right. And so I learned, okay, it takes more than being right, apropos of this conversation, makes a lot more, it takes a lot more than just being right. You have to get your timing right. You have to get a lot of other stuff. I always assumed that everybody knew what I knew. I now know, in, that, in those cases, nobody knew what I knew, because those stocks went up and up and up. I, it was a company, University Computing. I shorted the, shorted the stock at 48, went to 96. I had to cover before that. But then it went to zero. Well, I was right. Big deal. <laughs> Big deal. But that helped build my confidence that I knew what I was doing, but it destroyed my confidence as far as market timing. So what was different about your analysis? Had you gone deeper into this, uh, into this company? Because one of the things that, that you said on a number of occasions, and I think it's very impactful, is if you want to have conviction, you have to know more than not just... 90% of the people, but 98% of the people are following the stock. I mean, is it that you'd gone deeper? You'd read the annual report, you'd looked at you know, what would now be the 14K, or was it that you'd seen something with a greater level of skepticism or, or object, objectivity, which other people had missed? Well, it's both. Uh, you know, if you read the annual report, you've done more than 90% of investors. If you read the notes, to the annual reports, you've done more than, than nearly everybody, including the CEO of the company. Uh, so it is certainly knowing more than other people. But then you, it takes more than that. You also have to know more, but then you have to figure out what does it mean? Just because you know more, you have to then analyze it. If 100 people go into a room and hear a presentation, Steve, they'll all come out, most of them will come out with the same view. Seven or eight of those people will come out and say, aha. Aha, what this really means is it's going down the tubes or whatever you come out with, or you come out and say, seven or eight will come out and say, this is the best thing since sliced bread. You know, they will realize, they will analyze it and understand it better than the others. It's judgment. I don't know how to teach judgment. I wish I knew how to teach judgment. Facts are wonderful. Knowing more than everybody else is a big, big, big leg up. But then judgment, how do you get judgment? And that's certainly what I didn't have. I certainly didn't have timing in the, not that I do now, but I have a little better judgment than I used to and a little better timing than I used to because I learned to wait. So your prescription to be an above average investor, to go back to my original question, um, is be independent minded, do your work, don't try and perfect the timing, but if you develop a high enough level of conviction around it, see it through. Yeah, that's what I always do. Uh, and sometimes I get it right. Uh, but I certainly made plenty of mistakes in my life. I just told you about one of my early mistakes. You want to hear about my first wife? 
Oh my God, what a mistake that was, for God's sake. Well, I hope I made, she's watching. I made plenty of mistakes in my life. But in order to do that, when you, do, when you make money, you have, to, you have to make a lot of money. If you're going to have situations where you're going to you know, have significant losses on things that, where your timing's off, even if you get the, the eventual trade wrong, it does mean that on your good calls, um, you've got to make a lot of money. I mean, some, some people have said, and I, and I, I, I know um, a guy very much like this. He, he's, he's wrong 50% of the time, he's right 50% of the time, but he makes so much more when he's right that he loses when he's wrong. He's a very profitable trader. Um, and you've, you know, that's the other thing is like, when, when do you get out? Because on a, on a big call, like for example, when you, when you went bullish on commodities in the latter part of the, uh, in the last years of the 20th century. Um, I mean, that was a, that was a long cycle, but it eventually ended. I mean, it, you know, how do you know, even if you've got, if you, if, you, if you've got something that you still feel that you feel is, is bright and has a long-term potential, how do you protect your profits when the cycle eventually well, changes? Well, my, my view, my problem, my strength is I don't like to sell. You know, I like to own things. The, the, the kinds of things I buy, often you can own forever, or at least for many, many years. And since I'm lazy and I don't like to have to work too hard, but selling takes, that takes, it takes as much work to sell uh, almost as much work to sell as it does to, to buy something sure. uh, if you do want to do it right. And since I'm lazy, I prefer to own things for a long, long time. Uh, I own China, which you mentioned before. Uh, I have never sold it. Well, I think I'm selling one today. Uh, but I basically uh, just don't want to sell my Chinese shares. I started buying China in 1999. I've never sold any Chinese share except the one that I'm kind of I think I'm selling one today. Um, my plan is that my kids will own these Chinese shares someday. And investors do seem to be becoming more um, short-term, despite the fact that everything we know tells us that finding good people and backing them for the long term is the most successful thing you can do. Investors seem to be becoming more and more influenced by very short-term track records. and. Um, and, and that's and that's one of the things that's that's savage in the mutual fund industry right now. You know, that's <coughs> one of the things that, that uh, I wanted to touch on is this ETF phenomena. Um, I mean, it's probably the equivalent of the Nifty Fifty of of the day, which is buy everything um, in its weight. Right. Uh, don't do any research. Don't do don't do any in, don't take any views. Right. Um, don't even take a view on a, on a on a manager, let alone a stock, but just own a basket. And a lot of people feel great disquiet about this. I think actually, you actually, I think your commodity index has a few ETFs on it, does it? So perhaps you're not the guy to ask if you're in the ETF industry, but. No, 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 uh, I certainly see what's happening in ETFs. I mean, I pay enough attention to know what's going on. First of all, ETFs are very efficient, very easy, very uh, simple. There's no question about that. Therein lies part of the problem, of course, with ETFs. They are easy, simple, et cetera, and that makes it easy for somebody to say, oh, I want to buy Germany, buy the, the German ETF. Don't even look to see what's in the German ETF or whether it's a good ETF to own, and maybe it should be a terrible uh, ETF, and they, but nobody looks anymore. So there are excesses developing in the ETF business. There's no question about that. But don't worry, Steve. We're going to have a bear market, and when we have the bear market, a lot of people are going to find out, oh my God, I own an ETF and it collapsed. It went down more than anything else. And the reason it will go down more than anything else is because that's what everybody owns. Right. You know, the stocks that aren't in the ETF will go down. But they're not going to go down nearly as much as the stocks in the ETF because everybody owns the stocks in no. the ETF and they all have to dump. And so those stocks will go down the most. Liqu liquidity is a two-sided sword and, uh, yes, yes. and liquidity is entering. It's, it's easy nice and simple and of. wonderful and when you find out that easy, simple, wonderful investing loses you money and will lose you more money, then you'll change your mind. I you don't know if you remember because you probably, but in 1987 there was something called 
portfolio insurance. I do remember it. It was one of my first years in the industry. Well, Leyland O'Brien Rubenstein came up with this great idea. Fabulous. Portfolio insurance, you didn't ever have to worry again as long as you live. Well, portfolio insurance caused the whole thing to fall apart and collapse because everybody was, it was simple, easy, and wonderful, whatever the words I used before. But then we all realized, well, since everybody was doing it, and when it had to reverse, that meant those stocks collapsed more than anything else, and the stock market went down 20% in one day because of portfolio It was your insurance. birthday. It was my birthday. It was the best birthday I ever had in my life. You're exactly right. It was wonderful. I couldn't believe it because I'd been short uh, all summer, and stocks kept going up, and then all of a sudden, oh, I couldn't believe how much money I made. I, I, I do. I, I entered the industry in the summer of 1986. So uh, for me, October 87 was a real uh, introduction into how savage and rapid a bear market can be. One of the things that, you know, when you looked at what happened By the with way, that wasn't even really a bear market. If you look no, back at the no, charts, no. if you look back at the charts, you and I remember, and anybody who was there remembers, but if you look back at the charts of the 80s and 90s, that barely shows up. And I think if you'd, if you'd bought stocks on January 1st and taken the rest of the year off to sail around the world, you came back on January the 1st the following year, it was pretty much back where we were. Yeah, yeah. You still were, exactly, that's what I mean. It wasn't a bear market if you were there. It was a terrible, devastating, horrible experience. But basically you look back and it was, doesn't even show up. But at the time, you say in the, in the post-mortem on portfolio insurance, and maybe there is a lesson for us in there. It's the mechanical nature of in portfolio insurance that seemed to have done so much damage, which is that once it started selling, the nature of, by causing its own volatility, it pushed the market lower, which therefore required the model to sell more futures in order to, you know, uh, Isn't that going to be the up. case with ETFs? When, when you and I, who own ETFs, start selling our ETFs and everybody starts, else starts selling their ETFs, the ETFs will go down and that means the companies in the ETFs are going to go down a lot because right. everybody's getting out. Could it be indiscriminate? Yeah, it has to the be. The model tells you to tell every no, no, You don't have any choice. If you're running an ETF and everything is being liquidated from your ETF, you have to sell, whether you like it or not. Um, as I say, they're wonderful. They're simple. They're easy. It's magnificent how easy they are. But therein lies the problem, and many people are going to find in the next bear market that their ETFs go down more than other stocks, because the other stocks are not in ETFs. Now, there's a mag magnificent opportunity for somebody. I'm too lazy, uh, but if somebody can just take the time to focus on stocks that are not in the ETFs, there must be fabulous opportunities in those stocks, because they're ignored, and some of them have got to be doing very, very well, and nobody's buying them, because only the ETFs buy stocks. You know, you look at uh, the Japanese market, for instance. I mean, the Central Bank in Japan has bought up all the stocks and all the ETFs. The ones that they're not bothering with are just sitting there. Yes, it is an extraordinary thing that QE in Japan has ended up actually buying ETFs. And, and even perhaps more extraordinary, they're buying Nikkei ETFs, which is yeah. one of the po most poorly constructed indices known to man. That's what I said before. Most people don't even look to see what's in the ETF. There are plenty of very badly constructed ETFs, but nobody knows what's in them because it's so easy to pick up the phone and say, buy the Japanese ETF. They don't care what's in it. They don't know, and they're not going to find out until <laughs> they're going to find out eventually when it's too late. By the way, the Swiss National Bank is doing the same thing. I mean, the Swiss franc, it, it, when I was a kid, the Swiss franc was backed by gold. No debt and lots of gold. Now the Swiss bank is backed by Amazon and, and Google and, and American Fang stocks. They have staggering amounts of these stocks. And that's what backs the Swiss franc now. Yeah, it's an extraordinary situation in Switzerland for a country that's tr uh, traditionally prided itself on financial prudence that the, that the national bank is doing it. More than prudence, they back themselves on strength and, and even you know, you had to own a lot of gold. When I was a kid, that if you went to a Swiss bank, the first thing they did was put you at least 5% in gold, maybe 10% in gold, and then what else do you want? You know, that, that's where they started. And the Swiss National Bank, the same way. I know, this is, I mean, I have some Swiss francs, uh, sort of by accident. Uh, 
and I worry about them all the time. It's not enough for me to spend too much time worrying about, but I realize the Swiss franc is when it caves, when the bear market comes, is going to be a horrendous investment, just like the ETFs, because there are all these people who buy them saying, what's well, a Swiss franc? What could go wrong? Like Japan. What could go wrong? Well, we're going to, I own Japan, by the way. We're going to find out what can go wrong. Right. I own Japanese ETFs, as okay. a matter of fact. All right. And the reason I own them is because I know the Japanese central bank is buying them. Right. And so, I know all the Japanese brokers are buying. So that's, uh, so it's just don't, a question. Don't think I'm, I have some great insight here. I'm just telling you. And that's going to work until it stops. Until it stops. And it may have stopped yesterday for all I know. I don't think so. I'm not selling, but uh, I suspect that uh, th I know the Japanese market is going to have a gigantic collapse of down the road, whether it's next year or the year after, I don't know. No, it's, I'll, everything works until it works. But even though I'm being a little bit of a greater fool by owning Japanese ETFs, it's because I know that's what everybody else is doing. When, when you say you know that there's a collapse coming in Japan, is that because you think it's going to be a global phenomenon and Japan will be part of it? Or are there specific I, I, yes. reasons to be long-term bearish Steve, about in, Japan? In America, as you know, we've had bear markets every few years. Well, we used to. Uh, well, <laughs> well done. And Janet Yellen will tell you we're never going to have a bear market again because she's smarter than we are. She's smarter than the markets. And the central bank has things under control now. No, she's publicly stated this. Do not worry, we will not have uh, financial calamities again. The head of the Central Bank in America said that out loud officially. Mrs. Yellen. Yeah, Mrs. Yellen. Um, I happen to have a different view. Now, if you believe the American Central Bank, you shouldn't be talking to me at all. But we've had, we used to have uh, bear markets every several years. We always, always, since the beginning of the Republic, in my view, we will have them again. And the next one is going to be horrendous. The worst that you came in the business in 86, it'll be the worst in your lifetime, in your f financial experience. And the reason, you know, in 19, uh, 2008, we had a bear market because of too much debt, staggering amounts of debt. Steve, since 2008, the debt has gone through the roof. Every country in the world talks about austerity, no, Nobody has reduced their debt in the last few years. Everybody has increased their debt in the last few years. And so the next time we have a bear market, it's going to be horrendous because of this. Um, you, even China. You know, in 2008, Chinese had a lot of money saved for a rainy sure. day. It started raining. Singapore, they had a lot of money saved for a rainy day. It started raining. They started spending and helped save the world. But even China has a lot of debt now. So China is not going to be able to do for us what they did the last time around. Maybe the American Central Bank will be able to print more money. Maybe the Japanese and the Germans and others. But no, the next time around, it's going to be very, very bad. Now, I want to say again, Mrs. Yellen, the head of the American, the most important central bank in the world, says it's not ever going to happen again. Yeah. Well, I remember because we were running this long volatility fund uh, here in Singapore, that uh, you know, in 2006 and 2007, we were seeing papers coming out of the uh, Bank of International Settlements saying that financial innovation and uh, a, a derivative products had ensured that there would never be you know, excessive volatility in the markets again because financial innovation had made sure that those best able to uh, cope with the volatility now owned it so it wouldn't happen anymore. Um, and now we've got a situation where, um, I mean, clearly the level of gross level of debt is higher, but the argument is it's all in places that are better able to cope with it, and that banking regulation has made banks are much less risky. So the channels or the mechanism, the mechanism of these channels that's going to cause this uh, level of, de uh, of destabilization won't won't happen as rapidly or, or, or at all again. I mean, you're obviously somewhat skeptical about that. As a, well, I say hallelujah. I hope it's true. I'm sure I'm going to go broke because somewhere along the line I'm going to short everything saying this cannot last and I'll go bankrupt and Mrs. Yellen will be the richest person you know huh. and I'll be the poorest person you know. I want to turn to a few specific sectors uh, now rather than the, the general outlook of the world. It's, it's clear that you're very concerned about that, though not so concerned that you want to actually be fighting it with aggressive shorts right now. Um, one thing that, that you've spoken about in the past and one thing that we're 
volpes are exposed to uh, is agriculture. Um, it's an area that's generated quite a lot of um, comment, but from our experience, very few people have actually done anything about it. Very few pension funds, very few individuals have exposure to it. It's hard to get through the stock market. There are very few agricultural uh, companies, certainly on land owning companies. Uh, you can expose, get exposure to the food industry. Uh, but uh, you became very positive about the outlook for agriculture um, a while ago. Where are you now on that? I'm extremely bullish on agriculture. That it hasn't made me any money yet. Well, it has a little bit because one of my largest shareholdings, or a, a large, a, well, it's not one of my largest, but I am a director of a Russian fertilizer company, uh, which is doing what's well, making all time highs or near all time highs, which is pretty astonishing given that it's Russia and everybody hates Russia, as you well know. Uh, in fact, I, I'm startled that all of my Russian stocks are making all time highs, and this is a hated market. So it's something I have learned if you buy something that's hated, chances are you're going to make a lot of money right. down the road. Um, is this potash? No, this is called Foss Agro. It's phosphorus. Yeah, sure. It's one of the largest phosphorus of companies in the world. But um, Aeroflot, I own shares of the Moscow Stock Exchange, the home of Lenin, Stalin. You know, I mean, Mr. Lenin must be turning over in his grave because the shares of the Moscow Stock Exchange are at all-time highs. Poor Lenin, poor Lenin. Uh, but back to agriculture. <laughs> The, 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 stock, the prices are still not up. Prices are still down uh, for a variety of reasons. I mean, agriculture has been a disaster for 35 years, as you probably know. Uh, the, uh, I have a, an agricultural index of, of agriculture prices. It's down, what, 30 35% over the past 20 years. Now, there's not much in life where the prices are down 20% over the past 20 years, much less over the past 30 years. So agriculture is a disaster. And often throughout history, if you find things that are disasters and you buy them, you may lose money first or you may go bankrupt first, but usually you make a lot of money in the end. It's not the first time we've had big cycles in agriculture and, and real assets and probably not be the last time either. Is there a convenient way to, uh, for a smaller investor to to play this theme? Well, for me, I buy the Rogers Agricultural uh, ETN. It's on uh, the New York Stock Exchange. All right. Very, very simple to do. Uh, that's what I do, because uh, I'm too lazy to buy well, futures It's anymore. got your name on it. It's the least you could do, I think. Well, yeah, so I happen to know it's the best constructed uh, uh, index uh, for, for, agri for commodities. But that's, uh, so that's why I do it. But agriculture, back to the point, it's horrendous. It's a nightmare. For everywhere except Russia, by the way. Russia right now is agriculture is booming because America put sanctions and Europe put sanctions on Russia. So Russian agriculture is booming because <laughs> America has said we're gonna we're gonna hurt the Russians badly. We're gonna put sanctions on. So they did. You couldn't sell food to the Russians. The Russians said we won't buy food from the West. So now the Russian agriculture is booming. And if you ever read any Russian history or novels, you know that historically there have been times when agriculture has been big, big, big in Russia. It is again. I mean, America shot, the West, I should say, has shot itself in the foot because now they've developed this huge, booming, thriving industry in Russia. And if they continue the sanctions, I don't know, in three or four years, Russia is all going to be embedded. You know, it's going to have, they're going to have the capital, they're going to have the expertise, they're going to have everything they need to be a major agriculture player which is not going to be good for Europe or for America. Well, I've certainly got the land, and I think you can still uh, legally own land as a foreigner in Russia, which is kind of surprising to most people. You, you can, you can, uh, although I, I think it maybe each area, it may vary. I don't know. I don't own land. I'm too lazy to own land. I am a director of the uh, fertilizer company, and I've just recently become a director of a farm. Uh, 155,000 hectares of uh, a uh, big, big farm in, in Russia because it's all happening. I mean, it, somebody should call the State Department and say, don't you know what you're doing? <laughs> you're building a gigantic competitor. And all of those people voted for Trump, by the way. The, 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 the farm states all voted for Trump. Yeah, sure. And now, now they're building this gigantic uh, competitor for American agriculture. 
But what about corporate governance? I mean, we've been invested in Russia for 25 years. I mean, um, sometimes successfully, sometimes unsuccessfully. The corporate governance problems we have encountered during that period have made, meant that some of them what ought to have been good investments. You've had companies that have had good outcomes. Um, but the corporate governance has been so poor that the investors themselves have done badly. Well, I haven't had that problem yet because I, I, I haven't, don't, I, I guess I don't have the same ones you do. Uh, I read about problems like that. Uh, yeah, I mean, Russia's only been capitalist for a few years, as you know, and even then they were crooked capitalists, as you know. I was bearish on Russia for 48 years, 49 years. And that's very clear from uh, from your book, uh, oh, yeah, Investment yeah. Biker, if people uh, are, are familiar I've with I've always bad-mouthed Russia for decades, decades. Uh, but then I've seen, I think, something change in the Kremlin. They now realize they cannot play those corporate governance games, or call them what you will, uh, and that something is, cha is changing, I should say. It hasn't changed overnight. Uh, and if I'm right, then Russia's going to be great for Mr. Putin has changed somehow. The people in the Kremlin have changed somehow. This is not Switzerland. This is not the Netherlands by any stretch of the imagination, but it is changing. We've been exposed to some um, agricultural companies in Ukraine, um, which um, have not done well for us. Um, and that's perhaps not surprising given what's happened uh, in the Ukraine which was traditionally the breadbasket of the, uh, you know, of, of that of of the world. world. And for all I know, um, they're still producing grain there, but certainly the investors have not seen any of the uh, Well, proceeds. Steve, I said before I was bearish. I first went to the Soviet Union, including Kiev, in 1966, and came away saying, this is never going to work. I've turned bullish on Russia. I have not turned bullish on Ukraine. That place has been so badly managed for centuries, centuries. I'm not bullish on Ukraine because they still don't know how to run a country, they don't know how to run anything. So there are some places, like Belarus, I haven't turned, turned bullish on. I'm turning bullish on Kazakhstan. Some parts of the former Soviet Union I'm still negative on. It's only the Kremlin, the, the Moscow Kremlin, where I see things changing. Yeah. Well, you go to Kiev. Kiev's a nice place. Ukraine's a nice place, but I'll, I'll leave that to you. It's certainly very affordable right now. It um, is, and it may get more affordable. Can I move on to another area, which I know Real Vision uh, viewers have been traditionally very enthusiastic about, uh, and it's something you've commented on frequently, which is gold. You mentioned uh, the Swiss bank used to own it. Now they seem to prefer ETFs. Um, they prefer Amazon. Where do, you, where do you stand on gold right now? I mean, it's had a, a decent short-term run. We're at an 11-month high. Um, I own gold. I have owned gold for many, many years. I've never sold any gold. Uh, I haven't bought any serious gold for, uh, since 2010. Uh, I still periodically buy it to give us gifts and things. But uh, I'm not selling my gold. Uh, before this is over, gold is going to turn into a, perhaps a bubble. It may turn into, it's certainly going to get very, very, very overpriced. Uh, I'm not buying it now. Well, I mean, if war is about to break out, of course I'll buy it. I'll buy it higher and be happy to get it. But I don't expect that. But if it, uh, short of war, I expect another opportunity to buy gold and silver. And if it happens, I, I hope I'm smart enough to buy a lot. When because the next time, excuse me, next time, when the serious problems come next time, a lot of people are going to lose a lot of confidence in paper money and in governments. And throughout history, when that happens, people put their money in gold and silver. Whether they should or not is irrelevant. They always have, and I don't think mankind has changed enough yet that that's going to stop. You've commented a couple of times that you know entry levels are incredibly important. Um, you like to enter when when something's totally hated. Um, gold got pretty hated uh, about eighteen months ago. Had a decent recovery, but nothing like enough to make it. You want to really Steve? Pile Steve, in. there are a lot of people still who think that gold is holy can never go down, and the gold is holy. Now, when those guys give up on gold, that's when it's hated. When you see in the press that guys say, I am never going to buy gold again as long as I live. She lied to me. She cheated me. She's filthy. She's hopeless. That's when gold is really hated. May not get there. May not get there for decades. 
But I, that's the time to buy gold again, and I expect we are going to have a time like that before this is over. If that happens, I hope I'm smart enough to buy a lot of gold, a lot. Because the problem we've had in the past with gold, if you look at, say, 2008, it wasn't a good investment. Uh, and it went down yeah. with everything else. And this liquidity That's phenomenon what I'm saying. Sumped, uh, swamped everything else. That's why I suspect that there's going to be another opportunity to buy gold. And in the next time there's a lot of turmoil for a while, people are just going to be throwing everything out the window, nearly everything out the window, including gold. Uh, and the, the, the holy men, the mystics, the mystics will have to sell their gold too. And I hope I'm still solvent. And if I am, I hope I can buy a lot of gold. And what's your preferred way of, of doing that? Uh, there's a lot of debate about uh, whether you actually want to have the physical stuff. If you do, whether you want it in coins or bars, or whether you want to hold it in your own vault, or whether well, you want it in Singapore. I can give you my view of it. My, I, everybody should have uh, coins, uh, physical coins, as an insurance policy, as an emergency, if nothing else. You hope you never need them. But you got to start by owning gold coins, uh, coins that are recognized all over the world. If you start buying rare, exotic coins, you may have a problem. But you go down to the shop, he's going to say, what's that? But if you go down to don't the- I, Don't I remember, I, don't, I recall a story where you were tracking down some North Korean gold coins? I did, in fact. I did uh, a few years ago, bought some North Korean gold coins. 13, <laughs> to be exact, at, a, at a, uh, a coin fair here in Singapore. Um, yeah, my view is that, that, they're, that they're, as far as I know, they're impossible to get now. Uh, they're very difficult to get at all at any price, and I don't know why that is. But uh, my view is that North Korea is going to disappear, and when North Korea disappears, you're going to have a great collector's. First of all, your, your downside is the price of gold, because right. you can always melt them down. Uh, they won't go below the price of gold, and if I'm right, North Korea disappears, then they're going to have great collector's value. Right. And so, yeah, if you're looking for some, if you can find any uh, North Korean gold and silver coins, you might think about buying them. Possibly the only North Korean investment that's looking promising right now. Yes, uh, I'm an American, so it's, it's impossible for me, especially now, to invest in anything in North Korea. I guess you could still find stamps, maybe, and invest in North Korean stamps. But no, I mean, there are Americans who invest in North Korea, by the way, and there are uh, foreigners and Europeans who invest, and Singaporeans who invest in, in North Korea, but not me, uh, just because I'm lazy and I have not found a legal way to do it. But uh, it is going to disappear in a few years, in my view, <laughs> in a few weeks. If Mr. Trump blows it up uh, this year, then it will disappear quickly. Uh, and once it disappears, Korea is going to be a very, very, very exciting place to invest. You should put but in Korea the short term, that could be a, a catalyst for some actual volatility, which we've had yes, very little war, sign of for If many war breaks years. out, which I, I don't think is going to happen, although Mr. Trump's sometimes spontaneous, to use that, uh, that word. Uh, if war breaks out, it's certainly not going to be good for any of us. Certainly not good for any financial markets, except maybe on the short, it'd be good on the short side for every, everybody uh, if, if war breaks out. Uh, I don't expect it to happen. The Chinese have told them, okay, if North Korea starts a war, we will not come to their aid. We will not help them if they start it. But if you start it, if you, America, starts a war, then we have to defend North Korea. Now, I hope Mr. Trump has gotten that message because it's a very important message. And I hope the kid has the message too, because without China helping him, he cannot, it's suicide if he starts a war. And maybe he wants to commit suicide, but I, 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 I doubt that. And, and likewise, the South Koreans have said, we're not gonna play, we don't want a war. You want a war, Mr. Trump? You, now, that's not very practical because if, if Korea, if North Korea and America are at war with each other, <laughs> you look at the map. South Korea is pretty, pretty involved, whether they like to or not. But I don't expect uh, the war unless there's some kind of uh, accident. Let's put it that way. Um, but right. if it, if it happens quickly, North Korea will disappear, and then you should buy all the North Korean coins you can. So constructive on agriculture. Um, and 
waiting on gold, waiting on gold. Today right. I'd rather buy agriculture than gold if I had to buy one or the other. What about other commodities? Um, you know, we've seen a decent upcycle now well, after, after a fairly vicious down one. Oil is in the process of making a, a complicated bottom, if you ask me, uh, whether the bottom is at next year at 36, or I have no idea, I'm very bad at that. Uh, but I know we're making, uh, you know, in a few, year, a few months maybe, we're going to look back and say that in 2015, 2016, 2017, gold made its bottom, uh, and then things are going to be great. The, the known reserves of oil are in decline. You don't subscribe to this view, which some of our futurists do, that it's going to go the way of whale oil. It's going to become completely obsolete. May well. And be useless and valueless. May well. That's not going to happen in my lifetime. Uh, it may well happen. But there was a lot of money made in whale oil, you know, before it all disappeared. Quite a while. So, so these things don't happen overnight. And maybe oil is going to disappear, but it's not going to happen, certainly not in my lifetime and probably not in your lifetime. Right. Anything else that look, looks interesting I mean, on the, on the, uh, in the commodity space? Well, Kazakhstan uh, is a major commodity producer. Uh, Nigeria, these are places that... Uh, probably are going through dramatic uh, secular changes, uh, being disastrous for decades, centuries. Um, there's positive change taking place. I have no investments in either at the moment, but there are places on my, on my list uh, where you probably will find good opportunities. Mongolia's had a horrible bear market. Yes, Mongolia is not on my list. Uh, I have not seen, and it may be there, I just am lazy. Uh, I'm not seeing the positive secular changes that I do see in governance in places like Kazakhstan, believe it or not, and, and Nigeria, believe it or not. Uh, I mean, Nigeria has been such a horribly run country for, for forever, uh, so has Kazakhstan. But I think I see positive changes taking place. I don't see those changes in Mongolia. They may be taking place, but I don't see them. Vietnam would be a better place to look, in my view, than uh, Kazakhstan, than, uh, than, than Mongolia. And that, again, that may be out of my own ignorance. Uh, but Nigeria, Kazakhstan, and Vietnam are all much bigger countries in terms of population. Does that play a part in your, in your assessment? They are, but they're not bigger in terms of size. You know, no, it's amazing how big Mongolia is with three million people. Uh, I mean, it's the size of Western Europe or something and it only has three million people. Uh, yeah, but I, three million people is not necessarily a negative if there are great reasons to invest there. Right. You know, uh, you, can, you can invest in small countries and make a lot of money if, if things are right. Singapore, Singapore has five million people, but it's not smaller than, uh, than, than Mongolia. So it does, the, that doesn't matter so much to me, it, it, the, the conditions, the circumstances, the changes. You know, you find something cheap where there's change taking place. You can make a lot of money, whether it's three million or three hundred million people. Right. Graphene is something we should all know about. Uh, you ask about overlooked or un unnoticed thing. You know what graphene is? It's a form of carbon. Yeah. Yes. Uh, graphene did not exist 15 years ago. And then some guys at the University of Manchester were messing around in the lab and they produced this, they threw scotch tape, believe it or not, on, on carbon, graphene, and they won a Nobel Prize in chemistry uh, for scotch tape. It has some very particular properties which are it is, highly unusual it and is unique as far as I recall. Thinner but I don't than know much paper, about it. stronger than steel, et cetera, et cetera. I mean, scientists, not me, scientists say it's going to be as important as the internet down the road. Uh, if that's true, we should all know about graphene. There are companies in the process of, I think there are a couple of public companies, I don't own them, that are in the graphene business. But it's like many of these things, you have to be worried about the reality, like cyber currencies. You have to be worried about the, the reality rather than the, than the hype. But graphene I think graphene has a better future than cyber currencies, right. for instance. So please learn about graphene. Uh, I'm cognizant that we have taken up a lot of your time. Is there anything, if you were to sum up, 
you know, we've spoken about a lot of things that we need to be concerned about in the in the global financial uh, world, um, and we're not alone in, in being disquieted by it. Is there something that that you think that is very important that people are missing about that they should be worried about? Um, or is it just a question of the fact that they, they, there are things out there that are clearly ought to be worried about, but people are choosing not to worry about them? Well, as you know, I presume you know because you're in the markets, there is a lot of complacency now. There is a lot of confidence. You say there are a lot of bears, and maybe there are, but maybe the bears are just the ones who watch you, know, watch you uh, and, and instead of uh, us. When I see the press, I don't have a TV, so I don't watch those guys, but uh, I see, I don't see much skepticism. I don't see much worry. Janet Yellen, the head of the central bank in America said, it's okay, you don't have to worry anymore. Other central banks, that we've talked about the Japanese central bank, the Swiss central bank. You know, these were central banks that even 20 years ago were the soul of propriety. I mean, they were, there was nothing more solid than the Swiss Central Bank or the, even the Japanese Central Bank. I mean, these guys are out there. We've talked about that the Swiss franc is now backed by Amazon, but uh, the, the yen is now backed by Toyota or Japanese ETFs. Uh, these are very, very serious developments, at least in my view. Maybe I'm wrong. Yellen says I'm wrong. So people need to be extreme. They need to be knowledgeable. First of all, they don't listen to me because I'm just some guy on the internet, but if they get knowledgeable, I think they might get worried, and if they get worried, they'll start figuring out ways to protect themselves. You and I have discussed some ways to protect ourselves. Uh, I would not own bonds anywhere. Well, I own Russian government bonds in rubles, but short term, because they have such high yields, and I'm optimistic about Russia, as we've discussed. Um, I think there are great opportunities there, but People should be very, very worried about bonds in the, every, nearly everywhere in the world. They should be worried about stocks nearly everywhere in the world. I mean, these are going to be very perilous times, if I'm right. Uh, and when that happens, some of us are not going to survive. I hope I'm one that survives. You know, I hope I get it right enough to, to make it through this. If you look around this room, you see a lot of silver. I just noticed there's a lot of silver, a lot of silver here. I do think that precious metals will get us through. The dollar, I own a lot of US dollars, which I expect to uh, get very overpriced in the, in the turmoil which comes. People will look for a safe haven, they always have. They think the US dollar is a safe haven, it's not. America is the largest debtor nation in the history of the world. But people will flee to a safe haven, it will get overpriced, might even turn into a bubble at which point I hope I'm smart enough to sell. Uh, what do I do then? Maybe gold. If it works the way it often has, if the dollar gets very strong, gold gets weak. If it works that way, then it would be a good trade to sell my dollars and buy gold. By then the renminbi might be convertible. If the renminbi is convertible, maybe I'll sell my dollars and buy renminbi because if the dollar gets as strong as it probably will, everything will go down again. Nearly all currencies will go down against the U.S. dollar. At which point, if, you, if I sell my dollars, I got to figure out what to do. The renminbi, gold, silver, who knows? Cotton, who knows what will be the, uh, the asset of choice at that point? Maybe bitcoins. Maybe they will collapse too. Uh, it's not just the Chinese that are coming down hard on, on uh, cyber currencies now. Sure. A lot of people are. Uh, and it doesn't matter whether the governments are right or wrong. They can make things very, very difficult for a while. Sure. And that will be the time for the clever to figure out which ones to buy and how to, how to participate. Maybe I'll call you. Well, and you I don't can think tell we'll be able to, to help do. you. I've got a guy uh, working with me who, uh, who's a lot smarter than me about this. Well, He's figured out some ways to, to do things that I would have never worked out, but it's, it looks like to me to be a young man's game. That's always a very dangerous place to invest. You know, when things are going right, we all need a 26-year-old. There's nothing better than a 26-year-old in a great bull market, especially in a bubble. Because they're fearless. They're fearless. They don't know. They, it will never end. 
they will tell you why it will never end. They know that it cannot end and will never end. So in the bull market, you've got to have a 26-year-old. But when they end, you don't want the 26-year-old around. I had a former student once who made 500% in the late 90s, 500% two years in a row. They loved him. The next year, he lost everything for this company. They didn't love him anymore. Yeah, I he, was a 20, he was a 27-year-old, 28-year-old. I think you have something against guys in their 20s because the first time, uh, first time I became aware of you as an investor was a Barron's article written in 1987, summer of 1987. Um, and um, it's a very prescient article. I was certainly very, uh, I was very young on, on Wall Street. And uh, there was this guy, Jim Rogers, and they said, what are you bearish on, Jim? And you said, the world. There are all these 20-year-old, 20-something guys who are thinking that they deserve six figures just because they work on Wall Street and they know how to buy stocks. And uh, three, four months later, you turned out to be, uh, to be absolutely right. But as a 20-something at the time, I thought you were being very unfair on 20-something guys. Now, now that I'm 53, I, I share your view. These 20-year-old 20, these, these 20 guys, you've got to stay away from them. Well, but Steve, you made it. You survived. You know, you're a 26-year-old or 20-year-old who made it and survived, and so it's okay. Many of them don't and don't know why. They, they make a lot of money. They don't know why they made money, so they don't know why they lose money. Yeah. They don't know what happened. Yeah. Uh, got you, at least something happened. You're still here. You still have a job. You're still in the investment world. <laughs> I'm self-employed world. like you, so that I can't find anyone to hire me either. I mean, one of the things about... Um, trading is that success is is very often just as dangerous as Mm. a little bit of failure certainly you you know when i used to run a trading desk uh one of the things that i used to do is i'd take capital back from my least successful trader but i'd also take it back from my most successful trader Uh, and i used to do that because of this hubristic phenomena but uh, I did that until I was stopped from doing that by management because um, they didn't really think that that was smart and it upset the guys who were successful, uh, who were being very successful. Um, but I still think it's a very smart thing to do. You know, if you are, if you are, if you are all of a sudden a hot hand, it's very hard to uh, look yourself in the mirror and say, I'm not as smart as I think I am or not as smart as I hope I am. I mean, one of the one of the most dangerous things you can ever have, and you know, your, your experience in buying these puts, you know, underlines that is a uh, is a hot run. I think to a certain extent, people who got in on Bitcoin early uh, are feeling that um, because they've made so much money so easily. Um, it's very dangerous. Well, I often speak at universities and other places, and I say to them, the most dangerous time is when you've had a great success because you really think you're smart and you're immediately looking for what's next. I got to find another one because this is so easy and find me another one. And that's when you should close the windows and go to the beach or do anything to get away because that's when you really, really, really know how smart you are, how easy it is. And it's usually, for most people, a very dangerous time, especially if you're 27. (laughs) (laughs) Yeah, Um, absolutely. I think that's that's. But how do you do it? I mean, is it just wisdom? And you know, having wisdom could only be really uh, achieved through experience. I mean, well, how do you avoid it? This level of, of of overconfidence. I'm not as smart as other people, so experience is what taught me. Uh, experience is a, is the fool's best teacher. Well, I guess I was one of the fools. I learned from uh, making plenty of mistakes and no what can and will and does go wrong. I also now have a little bit of judgment based on experience and having seen all this, and I've read about many markets too. Even before I came along, the world's had markets, believe it or not, and uh, I've read about a lot of markets from the 19th century, the 20th century, uh, 